Thank you for joining. Again, a warm welcome to everybody. My name is Teddy Saitovitz. I'm a volunteer at Telfed. In the meantime, we're still in the informal part of today's event, and we're going around and asking people to share their video and tell us where they're from. Cynthia, what about you? Would you like to tell us where you're from? Welcome, Cynthia. Where do you guys come from? We'll move along. I'm sure Cynthia will come back to us. I see we also have Brian Sapir joining us. Brian from London. How are you, Brian? Welcome. Not too Hi. bad. How are you? A bit bad, bearded. Ah, <laughs> look at that. Look at that. <laughs> Father Christmas. Yes. Welcome, guys. Welcome. And Diana. <laughs> yeah, you can see. <laughs> so we do have London, we do have Israel, we do have Modain, we have Ranana, we have Alonso. <laughs> We have Jerusalem, we have Ariel. Anybody else like to share with us where they're from? Les Glassman. Hi, Teddy. <laughs> from Bait Begun here in Jerusalem. It's always good to, to see you and uh, Viva and Kulaka, but what you guys are doing. Wonderful. Welcome. Nice to see you, uh, Teddy. Nice to see you. Yeah. Good. You too. You too, guys. I hope you'll all enjoy this evening. Anyway. Once again, I'd like to introduce you to Aviva Tal O. Aviva will be moderating this evening's event. If you have any questions during the uh, lecture, please send them via the chat. Aviva will give you a wave, and she's also in charge of volunteerism and community events at Telfed. A big warm welcome to everybody. In a few moments, we will be starting today's event. I'm going to hand you over to Doron Klein, CEO of Telfed, to to pass on his words, and then uh, we will be introducing our speakers and begin the evening. Is anybody else out there that'd like to share with us where they come from? How about Avril? Stanley. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, don't have to be shy. You don't have to show your video either. Just tell us where you're from, and you're all welcome, and a warm welcome to you this evening. So, having said that, then a warm welcome once again. I hand you over to uh, Doron Klein. And uh, Doron, welcome. How are you doing? I also want to share with you that Doron is a brand new grandfather and he's just yeah. had a granddaughter less than a week ago. So, he's in, still enjoying that. Uh... Mazel tov, Mazel tov, Doron. Thank you. It's a, it's a wonderful new status. <laughs> So, uh, Erev Tov, everybody, and uh, very happy to be with, with you all here, sitting in the city of Ariel. And I said, that's great to, uh, for us to have the, the merit of hearing from the wisdom of the university while I'm actually in the city of Ariel. So, there's a, another way to connect. So, um, a first, a few thank yous. Uh, first of all, to Adrian, who's with us here. So, uh, Adrian is uh, representing the university tonight uh, and who, is, who works in their resource development department. So, uh, Adrian and I have known each other for, for many years and uh, it's I'm great scared. to have a, a fellow South African Ole uh, involved in the university. And uh, also going back about 30 years ago, I was the Dean of Students at REL University. So I also have a strong connection to the institution. In those days, it was the College of Judea and Samaria. <laughs> Things have changed a lot, thank God, since then. Uh, so I want to thank uh, Adrian for helping us to put together this, this evening and bringing the lecturers and uh, strengthening the connection between Telfed and the university and being able us to be able to tap into the amazing knowledge that's available from Ariel University and that we can enjoy uh, virtually. I want to thank uh, Teddy and Aviva, uh, who tirelessly worked to also put together these lovely events to, to bring uh, great lecturers to, for us to expand our knowledge and to connect. What we have here is a wonderful virtual community that, that Teddy and Aviva have built since the onset of Corona, with well over a thousand participants already in our events, and it's really thanks to thanks to Teddy's initiative and. And, and Aviva working alongside 
that uh, that's brought us here. So, kolakavod to both of you. I'd like to just for a few minutes discuss the organisation that's behind this evening. Before we talk about uh, Ariel University, I just want to relate to Telfair itself, so we'll know a little bit about the organisation. So, I suppose you can you can view it as an advert, right? <laughs> Look at that way. Like you know, when you go to a free show, there's always adverts before. Look at this as the advert, right? So what you have on your, your screen uh, is, the, is, is the, now going to be a very short PowerPoint presentation about TELFED. So it's, we'll, we'll, we'll discuss the organization for like the next five minutes. So TELFED is our nickname, Tel Aviv Federation, because in 1948, we were in Tel Aviv. Today we're in Ranona, been there since the early 80s. And uh, we didn't change our name to, I don't know, Runfed, right? It's Telfed Stuck, Tel Aviv Federation. In 1948, that's where our offices were. And why were we there in 1948? We were set up by the South African Zionist Federation to be their branch here, to look after the 800 Machal soldiers. Mit Nadvei they came to volunteer to bring with the experience from their World War II activities. And they came to volunteer in the newly formed IDF, the only time in the history of the IDF that they actually actively asked for volunteers. And thank God they really did well. We won the war. And at the end of the war, the South African Zionist Federation said to Telfed, well, close up shop. Well done, guys. You did really well. Come back home. But lo and behold, a large number of those 800 wanted to stay in Israel. There was no ministry of absorption. So Telfed continued to operate. We no longer part of the South African Zionist Federation. For the last 40 years or so, we've been independent, but we still carry that name with pride. The, if we look at the mission, we want to promote the quality of life for Southern Africans and Australians. We deal with both. A lot of our Australians are actually also ex-South Africans. We want to, to experience the quality of life that you can only get in Israel, being a Jewish majority in a Jewish state. We want them to participate and contribute to Israeli society. We're not there to keep uh, South Africans in, in or Australians in a bubble, but we want them to take what they've brought from them from South Africa and Australia and to make Israel a better place. And the last slide just shows what the organization does. Each one of these squares is a full-time staff member with a committee of volunteers. Teddy tonight is the volunteer chairman of the Aliyah Projects Committee, and that connects here to Klita. So we're in touch with the Olim before they come to help them prepare for the absorption. We meet them at the airport, see them through the process. And after they've arrived, we're in touch with them during their first year on a regular basis to make sure they're being absorbed well. So a full-time Klita advisor. Obviously, lone soldiers need a lot of help, both before the army, during the service, and afterwards. So a special committee that deals with the lone soldiers. We're the only organization that provides housing, 105 apartments in Ranana and Tel Aviv, the people who live in our subsidized rental apartments pay 30% less than their neighbors do in the surrounding buildings. So it's subsidized rentals, and they can stay in our buildings for up to three years. 70%, 70% of the rental income that we get goes here. It goes to help the needy, and we support 450 needy or limb every month. It's financial assistance that costs us two and a half million shekels a year. A lot of it is food cards, making, people, making sure people are eating okay, and social work counseling by a full-time social worker. Our events, Aviva's in charge of our events. We have up to 90 events a year, 5,000 participants, and ideas to for veteran Olim and new Olim to support one another, and we thank you for being part of this event and invite you to continue being part of the wonderful Telfed events that happen every week. The Telfed magazine, the website, the newsletter goes to 10,000 recipients. Very active Facebook. If you're not on there, please go and like the Facebook page. Become part of our Facebook community, Instagram for the younger ones amongst us, right? And the Telfed magazine that goes out three times a year. So people can feel and see what the South African community is doing. We provide over 500 scholarships every year. The only only organization that gives out its scholarships at the Knesset. And that's scholarships for Olim and also for potential Olim. Those for people that have come to study here and haven't yet decided whether they want to make Aliyah or not. Our volunteers, each one of these squares, as I said, is a, is a committee of volunteers. They welcome in the Olim into the different regions. And Aviva is in charge of that, the region of volunteers. And we have volunteers that teach English. They teach English to other Olim. Yeah, we have teaching English to Ethiopian Olim. 
and employment. We have a full-time employment advisor which deals with the Olim pre-Aliyah and post-Aliyah to prepare them for the workforce. If any of you would like to be a volunteer, if you'd like to be a mentor, if you feel it in your field, you can help somebody get into the workforce and you can be a volunteer mentor in a certain profession, or you'd like to volunteer at Telfit in any one of the spheres, please be in touch with Avuva. I want to thank you very much for joining us. And I'm sure we're going to have a very interesting and, and enlightening evening. And I'd like to hand over to Adrian. Adrian, you're still muted. Thank you very much. <clears throat> it's wonderful to be with you, with everyone here tonight. Um, I can't help but at this uh, forum to say, how's it? I can't, re I can't resist that. Um, firstly, um, thank you to everyone who's joining us. For those who were here last week, welcome back. For those here for the first time tonight, welcome. Um, I know, as I said last week, I'm the least interesting person here, so I'll be very short and to the point. Um, as Don alluded, Ariel is a very new university. We became a university in 2012. In the last eight years, we've gone ahead at uh, sound break, uh, barrier breaking speed. Um, we've uh, grown to 16, over 16,000 students. We opened um, our new medical school last year with the first intake of 70 students. I'm very glad to see that we are joined tonight by Professor Ashkenazi, who's the Dean of the medical school and will be speaking next week. Uh, fascinating individual himself. Um, we now are home to the leading institution in the world for compact particle accelerators and doing amazing research into cancer treatment, uh, fantastic ways with uh, electron lasers to uh, treat cancer cells without damaging healthy cells. As you saw last week, we have the only university with a winery on campus doing uh, wine research and bringing back the grapes of King David at the tables of the Jews of today in Israel and around the world. Um, we have the leading uh, medical simulation center in the country where both uh, MDA and the army and search and rescue all train on our campus. Uh, we have a fascinating cybersecurity center where um, we, we um, have uh, one of our time trained at us and we have companies from around the world trained as cybersecurity teams in our offices over in our center. Um, and basically what we're looking to be is the best whatever we can be. We look to see what's needed in Israel, what's missing and how can we be the best at it. And thank God the last eight years, I think what we've done has been absolutely revolutionary. Um, it's very exciting to be have, uh, Dr. Boaz and uh, Professor Boaz and, and, and Dr. Vered Kaufman with us um, to, to present their, their leaders in their fields. They're very exciting. And uh, Ted, Ted will explain a bit more about that. Um, and we'd love to welcome everybody who's on this uh, Zoom to our campus. If anyone wants to know about more about the, uh, the university, how they can maybe help support the university, you can get our details through Telfed. We'd be happy to welcome you. And we're very excited to be meeting all of you here tonight. With that, I'll hand over to the stars of the show. To um, um, thank, uh, thank you for that, Adrian. Before we go to the stars of the show, I also would like to add some sweet words about the stars of the show. So I'm going to start with uh, Professor Mona Boaz. Mona Boaz is an epidemiologist whose research focuses on nutrition as a risk factor for morbidity and mortality outcomes. She has more than 200 scientific publications in top nutrition medical journals. As chief of the nutrition scientist sciences department at Ariel University, Professor Boaz, Boaz teaches in epidemiology statistics and research methods to both nutrition students and medical students. As an experienced researcher, Professor Boaz has headed large multi-central research project, projects such as the measuring nutrition risk in hospitalized patients, a study in the status of nutrition in hemo, hemodialysis patients, and the multinational, the Ariel University survey on dietary changes and anxiety during the corona pandemic study. The research interests include nutrition epidemiology, particularly regarding obesity, diabetes, and end-stage renal disease. As an epidemiologist, Professor Boas has served as a research consultant of hundreds of studies 
in the field of nutrition, international medicine, and pharmacology. In addition, she has consulted for projects in the area of health and nutrition policy and quality assurance. She has several she has served as the principal investigator of dozens of clinical trials, including the trials of pharmaceuticals, medical devices, functional foods, and nutrifarmics. Verit Kaufman, Dr. Kaufman is an epidemiologist and a registered dietitian. Dr. Kaufman is a faculty member of the School of Health Sciences, Department of Nutrition Science at Ariel University. She is, an, she is an affiliated scientist with the Center for Urban Health Solutions at St. Michael's Hospital in Toronto. Dr. Kaufman has conducted in intensive uh, trials and to reduce childhood obesity and examine the association of social factors of health and nutrition with chronic diseases. During her research, she focused on developing culinary adapt methods in, vul in vulnerable populations. A big welcome to you both. Thank you for sharing of your time and your knowledge with the, com the community, and we look forward to, to that. So Aviva is going to mute everybody at this time. If anybody has any questions, please send them via the chat and a warm welcome to our two special guests. Well, thank you so very much for that. Such a lovely introduction that I, I, I'm <laughs> embarrassed. <laughs> it's like being at your own funeral, isn't it? Um, if, if you could please make uh, Varen and I the co-hosts uh, because we'd like to present our, our, there we go. Very nice. Okay. So, so Varen, I'm, going to, I'm going to leave it to you to be operating the uh, sure. presentation. Thank you, Vivian. And, and uh, thank you everyone for inviting us. Okay. So okay. if you can go. go. Okay, so uh, you've already been introduced to us. We are both faculty members. I'm the chair at the uh, Department of Nutrition Sciences at RL University, and we're very, very excited to be here tonight. And we're here to debunk nutrition myths. But before we start, okay, we were already introduced, so we can skip that. We'd like to take a moment and tell you about some research that our department is currently uh, working on. Uh, we're working on putting together a national weight loss registry for Israel. Uh, the title of the registry will be the Israel. National Weight Loss Registry and the initials come out thin, which we thought was very witty. And um, what we're trying to do is to identify factors leading to successful weight maintenance of weight loss. And I think anybody who's tried to lose weight uh, will tell you that it's not that hard to get the weight off for a few weeks, but then after that, it tends to come right back and sometimes with a vengeance. So what we're interested in doing is looking at people who are overweight and identifying those people who actually were successful at weight loss. And by identifying those people, we wanna characterize them in terms of pretty much everything. How did they lose weight? How are they maintaining it? And we're looking at variables that are dietary variables, exercise variables, behavioral variables. We'll also be looking at biochemical markers and even markers of what's very popular today, the microbiome, which is the bacteria that live in our intestine. And what we're hoping to do is to look at those few people who are successful, identify what makes them successful, and then based on that, create programs that we'll test using clinical trials. Unfortunately, obesity is a huge problem in the world today. In the Western world, um, in the OECD, about 60% of adults are overweight or obese. In Israel, the latest number we have is about 50%. Um, that doesn't mean we're in a good situation. We're clearly not. And we need to find ways to fix that problem because it's a big problem. And there are a lot of health issues associated with obesity. So uh, Vera, do you want to add to that? Um, no, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Well, in any case, you certainly don't need to be a researcher to be interested in nutrition. I think pretty much everybody is interested in nutrition, whether it's from the aspect of health and wellness, uh, whether we're interested in working toward risk, reduc risk reductions for disease and mortality, and whether we're looking for improved quality of life. Food also, whether we're trying to lose weight or not, is such an important part of our lives it, it gives us a lot of sensory and hedonistic uh, pleasures. And uh, much of our time as humans is spent thinking about preparing and eating food. So it occupies a great uh, amount of a given day. Um, we all learned about nutrition at some level or another. We learn about it at home. Uh, we learn about it at school, maybe not as much as we should. Um, and, and on that note, I, I'd like to say that at REL University, we're the first university to offer a teaching credential program for, um, it's a secondary credential for um, biology and nutrition that will enable teachers to go into schools and start creating curriculum that will teach proper nutrition habits from an early age. And we think that's a really important step. And that's only at REL University. At the university level, of course, there are various levels of degrees of nutrition science. Sometimes that will end in a career as a dietitian, who's the professional that works in the health settings to teach proper nutrition and provide nutrition therapy. But all of us are bombarded constantly with uh, media messages about nutrition, not all of them very accurate. And it comes in all forms of media, whether it's print media, social media, we're bombarded by it all day long. So I took a look at some of the media that is uh, promoting nutrition. And we can see here that almost every women's magazine that you pick up is going to have at least one article about the latest weight loss uh, method it may or may not be true and pay attention that right next to that, they'll have a recipe about how to make the tastiest chocolate cake ever. They'll also have in the men's magazines, the emphasis tends to be rather than on weight loss, more on muscle building and health. So they go at it from a slightly different angle, but they're still going at it in the men's magazines. As we know, there are entire magazines devoted to nothing but diet and weight loss. And then what's most fascinating is that there are magazines who probably shouldn't have anything to do with weight loss, like Child Magazine or Parent Magazine, and yet you'll always find some kind of message about weight loss and nutrition in those uh, journals. So, um, so what happens because of that bombardment that we get from the media? What happens is that we start to believe myths about nutrition. So what's a myth? A myth is a belief that persists even in the face of evidence to the contrary. Why do they persist? Well, the first reason is repetition. If you hear something enough times, we start to believe that it must be true, whether it's true or not. Another is a marketing angle, a marketing technique that's called content amplif amplification. And this is a method whereby somebody who'd like to sell you something pairs what he wants to sell you with something that has nothing to do with it, but is likely to attract attention. So for example, nutrition interests everybody. So they'll pair nutrition with something like babies or, well, that's even less crazy, but uh, things that have nothing to do, car parts and get you to go and look at that magazine and look at what they're selling you because there's something in there that interests you. So that technique is very widely used and often with nutrition. And um, also there's publication bias, which means that people tend to publish things that confirm what they believe. And so you tend to see these myths propagated over and over again in the press. So it's really not our fault that we believe them. There's a whole system out there that's helping us to believe them when they're not true. So what we're gonna do tonight is take a look at some common nutrition myths, and we're gonna see why they're not true. So the first myth that we're going to look at is going to be the myth that if you want to lose weight, don't eat carbohydrates. I think that's a pretty common myth. So let's take a look at what carbohydrates are. Carbohydrates are macronutrients, which means they're a type of nutrient that gives us energy. And there are three 
categories of macronutrients. There's fats, proteins, and carbohydrates. So carbohydrates is one of the types of nutrients that provides us with calories, with energy that we need. And it, carbohydrates are essential in order to fuel the nervous system, and that includes your brain. Your brain needs carbohydrates. It influences mood. Here's a key, it usually makes you feel happier. It, it provides energy for your muscles so they can work, and it even facilitates fat metabolism. There are different kinds of carbohydrates though, and we often divide them into two large categories, simple or complex. So chemically carbohydrates, if you can conceive of them, they're like little chains of sugars that are bonded together. And if we have only one or two of these sugars, those are called simple carbohydrates. Simple carbohydrates are very rapidly digested and absorbed. And as a result, they tend to cause a lot of fluctuation in our blood sugar. So examples of simple carbohydrates are uh, fructose, which is the type of sugar you find in fruit, lactose, which is the type of sugar you find in milk, and there are a lot of Jews who are very sensitive to lactose, and sucrose, which is simple table sugar. The complex carbohydrates have three or more of those chains. These carbohydrates tend to be absorbed much more slowly, so they're better for us. They do less variation in our glucose, and also they provide other benefits. So one good, uh, two good examples of complex carbohydrates are fiber and starch. We hear a lot about fiber. It's really good for us. It's important for regulating our um, digestive system. And examples of complex carbohydrates are beans, peas, lentils, peanuts, potatoes, corn, whole grain breads, and cereals. So those are all good examples of complex carbohydrates. So in order to look at, do we need to cut out carbohydrates in order to lose weight? Uh, our group did what's called a meta-analysis. A meta-analysis is where we take a lot of clinical trials and use a statistical method to kind of bind them together so that we can get a really big sample size and make a definitive statement one way or the other about whether it works or not. So what our group did was we compared studies in which there were low carbohydrate diets and high carbohydrate diets. So first let's define what's a low carbohydrate diet. Um, examples of low carbohydrate diets that I'm sure you've heard of are like the Atkins diet, the zone diet, and today very popular are the ketogenic diets. The rationale for a low carbohydrate diet is that if you restrict the carbohydrates to almost none in your diet, you're going to spontaneously decrease the amount of food that you eat, and that's gonna to lead to weight loss. And the reason they think you're gonna spontaneously decrease the amount of food you're gonna eat is because there really isn't a lot to eat once you cut down carbohydrates. Um, in the short term, these diets have been shown to cause rapid weight loss. It, they are good at controlling your blood sugar variations and insulin levels. It improves your lipid profile. So you can look at that and you say, well, that's, that's all wonderful. Um, there's some evidence that's sort of still controversial about whether it improves satiety after you eat and reduces hunger and that it may preserve lean body mass and increase the speed at which your metabolism works. Um, the jury's still out on that. Okay, the other side of that coin is the low fat diets that we looked at. And the low fat diets, uh, examples of that would be the Ornish diet and the Learn diet. And those of you who are old enough might remember the Ornish diet from back in the day when um, Bill Clinton went on a diet and lost all of this weight. And there were just pictures of him with his physician, Dean Ornish. So what type of diet was this? This was a diet that was very, very low in fat. And um, the concept of this diet is that you replace fat in the diet with carbohydrate. Now, every gram of carbohydrate has four calories. Every gram of fat has nine calories. So if you replace gram for gram carbohydrate for fat, you're already cutting out more than half of the calories. So that's the concept behind it. These type of diets are supposed to uh, reduce LDL, which is the bad cholesterol in your blood and improve insulin resistance. And if you emphasize the complex carbohydrates, you're going to get nice control of blood sugar, 
And um, because you can be eating lots of fruits and vegetables, it should also give you a very nicely balanced diet with adequate vitamins and minerals in it. So the question that we're asking ourselves, is a diet a diet? And what happened when we compared these two major types of diets? Well, what we discovered was that there was absolutely no difference in weight loss between the two types of diets. So there was no advantage to cutting carbohydrates out of the diet in terms of weight loss. We also looked at metabolic differences. And what we found was that if you consume a low fat diet, in other words, a high carbohydrate diet, then you get nice reductions in LDL, which is the bad cholesterol. On the other hand, if you eat uh, uh, a low carbohydrate, high protein diet, you get high levels of HDL, which is the good cholesterol, right? So both of those are going to improve your, your they're, they're going to prevent heart disease and atherosclerosis at some level, just in two different ways. And both of the diets were associated with nice reductions in blood pressure. There were also no group differences, no difference between the two types of diets in terms of hunger, satiety, cravings, or satisfaction. So that kind of leaves us with the notion that one appears not to be better than the other. And I guess you could conclude that it's a personal preference which way you go with that. But you certainly don't need to cut carbohydrates out of the diet in order to lose weight. Okay, so what do the nutrition experts tell us? Well, the US National Institutes of Health and also very many other august bodies, including the World Health Organization, say that carbohydrate intake should be between 45 and 65% of your calorie intake every day. So that means if you're eating a diet of say 1800 calories a day, you should have 202 to 292 grams of carbohydrate in that diet. And of course we make some adjustments in the event of some diseases like uh, diabetes. But the bottom line is you certainly do not need to skip carbohydrates in order to lose weight. So I just wanna point out what gets called good carbohydrate and bad carbohydrate. When we are eating carbohydrates, we wanna emphasize the complex carbohydrates. These are high in nutrients. They uh, are high in naturally occurring fibers. They're low in sodium. And examples of this type of carbohydrate are whole fruits, whole vegetables, legumes, and whole grain products. On the other hand, the simple carbohydrates, the kind we'd rather kind of limit or even avoid in our diets, are the kind that tend to be high in calories, low in nutrients, low in fiber, high in sodium, and examples might be cakes, white bread, and refined pastas. The second myth that we want to deal with is whether or not taking vitamin C supplements will prevent colds and the flu and, um, and perhaps even corona, right? We've been hearing that as well. So vitamin C is an essential nutrient. We must consume it in our diets because our bodies cannot synthesize it. We must actually consume it almost every day. So um, it is necessary for so many processes and, and, and uh, things that go on in our body. It's essential for growth, for development, for the repair of all of the body tissues, including the collagen formation, iron absorption, and it is essential the immune function and wound healing. Scurvy, it is one of the, those diseases that has been known for that many years, as ancient as the 1500 in Egypt. Scurvy was even known as the plague of the sailors. You, all of you must, must have heard about this. We know today that inadequate dietary vitamin C for at least three months can cause scurvy. Uh, one of the manifestations in the second stage of scurvy would be bleeding gums, loose teeth, easy bruising, uh, as well as impaired immune function. So at risk individuals for developing in the uh, developed world for developing scurvy would be people who smoke and have poor dietary intake, pregnant or lactating women with poor dietary intake as well, individuals with eating disorders, substance abusers, frail elderly, and people with severe gastrointestinal diseases, the most prevalent population to be at risk uh, for scurvy are elderly men 
uh, of lower SES actually. These are the most prevalent in, of course, the Western world. So um, there is a question, can vitamin C help prevent winter illness by boosting the immune function? We hear every now and then about uh, special formulas developed of vitamin C. So of course, if you are deficient in vitamin C, uh, so taking vitamin C as a supplement will help your immune system overall. But if you're not efficient in vitamin C, taking more of what you don't need actually does not improve your health. In fact, uh, uh, we, we actually, when we take access vitamin C and access is above 2000 milligrams a day, we just clear it out from our body in the urine. We also know that taking high doses of vitamin C can cause diarrhea, vomiting, and other gastrointestinal uh, symptoms. So, are you, or I would say, are we deficient? It's very unlikely in the Western world to be deficient. For adults, the recommended daily amount of DRI for vitamin C is between 65 to 90 milligrams a day. The variation is across sex and age groups. Just a few examples uh, for sources of vitamin C. You can see here half a cup of sweet red pepper would supply you with uh, more even than the, um, the recommended dietary allowance with 95 milligrams. One medium orange uh, would supply us with 75 milligrams of vitamin C. In, in a usual supplement, you would have a dose of 500 milligrams of vitamin C. That will, um, will be equal to as if you've been eating five cups of cooked broccoli or about eight oranges. It is not a portion that um, people usually eat a day. So just whenever you check a supplement, try to, to make an equivalent to the kind of food that you would know how much it contains of vitamin C. So again, one kiwi fruit, for instance, is 60. Um, so that is, I think, a good example of vitamin C. One way to, uh, to get enough vitamin C would be to consume five or more servings of fruit and vegetables each day. Uh, if you are not deficient, of course, as we said, you will not benefit from taking additional vitamin C. It will not, unfortunately, prevent any winter illness. It will just co cost you more, of course, because you needed to pay for the supplement and may cause you a gastrointestinal illness. Usually, um, even from supplement, you cannot overdose on vitamin, uh, sorry, you cannot overdose for, for vitamin C from your diet, but you can overdose from supplement because as I have mentioned before, in a, a simple supplement or a pill, you would have at least 10 times of what you would have in any average food that contains vitamin C. Um, Myth number three is that we wanted to examine is whether or not taking vitamin D and zinc will prevent corona. Most of you uh, probably uh, heard a recommendation about taking uh, supplements of vitamin D and even zinc. And here we come to the question of, first of all, what is vitamin D? So vitamin D is actually a hormone rather than a vitamin. It is generated in the skin of animals, including humans. When light energy is absorbed by a precursor molecule, it is also absorbed from food. So we can actually, and most of us do, absorb um, vitamin D to a certain extent from food and generate it ourselves. There are, of course, variation across, um, across uh, areas uh, around the world, and I will be more specific in the next slide. And there are variation that has to do with how much of your body surface is covered with cloth and in which hours of the day are you being outside and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we know that vitamin D is necessary for the absorption of calcium from the gut. So even if people eat a lot of calcium but do not have a sufficient amount of vitamin D, their calcium won't be absorbed in the bones and in our uh, uh, intestine as we wish to. Uh, it helps maintain proper blood levels of calcium and also phosphorus that contributes to, to the bone health. 
and it boosts the, and, and helps um, the, the normal activity of the immune system. So why? Why is vitamin D uh, so interesting at this time? It has been shown that there is a receptor for vitamin D, which is expressed on cells that are involved in the immune system. We know uh, that, that the deficiency in vitamin D is associated actually with increased autoimmunity and increased susceptibility for infection. And we also know that uh, adequate blood vitamin D uh, uh, levels inhibits the production of inflammatory cytokines. You may have heard about the cytokine storm that is associated with COVID-19, which is actually an overreaction of the immune system where the body attacks its own tissue. So no wonder that vitamin D is um, so major uh, when we look into supplements at, at those times. There is first a seasonal stimulus hypothesis that looks uh, and has been developed through epidemiological observation of influenza A epidemics, prior epidemics. Uh, there is, a, as we know, a reduced sun exposure in the winter, and that coincides with peak influenza cases. Saying that, I want to emphasize so that the two occurrences occur in the same time. Uh, and there is a, an assumption that this may be mediated through reduced synth synth synthesis and serum levels of vitamin D, which in turn affect the immune system. There has also been, an has been detected uh, an association between latitude and corona. So investigators that examined COVID-19 death rate in 88 countries and correlated this to proximity to the equator as a marker of sun exposure has actually found a significant inverse association between death rate and proximity to the equator. So the uh, author uh, attributed this association to vitamin D and uh, I would like to make a distinguish here and emphasize the difference between association and causality, which is a very important point to highlight and showing you a short video. So it will take me a minute to share it with you. I'm actually showing you now a video, a TED, a, a very short TED talk of a, a mathematician. Welcome. I came here today to warn you about the dangers of ice cream. You may not be aware of this, but these innocent looking cones full of sweetness are one of the major causes of drownings. And I've got the numbers to prove it. So if you plot a graph of the number of ice creams that are sold and you compare it with the number of drownings, you can see there is clearly an upwards trend. And I think it's very safe to conclude from this that we should ban ice cream because it's very dangerous. <laughs> Since you are all smart people, you've probably figured out there's something wrong with my example. What's really happening here is, of course, that there is an underlying factor, which is nice weather, you might have guessed it. And if the weather is nice, more people will go out swimming and unfortunately drown. And at the same time, more people will buy ice cream. And it's not the ice cream that's causing the drownings. And here it's really easy to see that there is something wrong. but. Jumping to an incorrect conclusion about causality when you see a correlation is the most often made logical mistake. And today my goal is to make sure that in the future you can recognize this mistake. And I really hope you can avoid making it in the future for yourselves. And I'll do this by just giving some famous uh, examples. And the first one is really rather innocent. The fact is that married men live longer than single men. If you look at the statistics, you see that this is really happening. And uh, women's magazines, they like to conclude from this that marriage is very healthy for men because it makes them live longer. <laughs> well, 
A friend of mine, uh, he likes to joke that marriage mainly makes life seem longer, but <laughs> that's because his wife is... Um, <laughs> But so, can anyone guess what's going on here? Because there is a causal relation, but it's the other way around. The fact is that men who are healthy and rich and well-educated and have a much higher life expectancy, these are the men that are much more likely to find a wife. That's the way women are. And the guys who have a very low life expectancy, so they're unhealthy and poor, they are not as likely to get married. So it's the high life expectancy that is causing the marriage not the other way around. Well, and this, of course, you know, it's not so serious. No one will get married just because he read this. So let's move on to a more serious example. It was also more serious research. In Nature was a study in 1999 that showed that young kids who sleep with the lights on, that they have a much higher probability of becoming short-sighted later in life. Well, and the researchers, they were smart and they wrote very careful that they had found the correlation and they didn't know how the causal relation might work, but just to be sure, they advised all parents to turn off the lights at night. And in the popular media, this became that bed lamps were night abuse, uh, children's abuse, and that it was very bad if parents used lamps in the bedroom. And many parents were worried. I can imagine if this would have happened when my son was sleeping with the lights on, I would have felt really bad. But luckily, the article had to be corrected the next week. And maybe some of you can guess, if there are biologists in the, in the audience, they know. Uh, Short-sightedness is genetic. And so it's parents who are short-sighted, and those are the parents who like to leave the light on in the bedroom. <laughs> and they also are the parents who have short-sighted kids. So again, you know, a simple mistake, easy to make. Then what is, I think, uh, the worst example I know, I know many of them, I see at least one of these in the newspapers every week, but this is a classic one. In the 70s, researchers found that there's a very strong link between kids who do well in school, get good grades, and kids who have a high self-esteem. And they concluded from this that it's very important to make sure that young kids are you know, raised to be confident and proud of themselves, because if their self-esteem is high, the good results will follow. And this was what was told to parents, especially in the US, for generations, that just make sure that your kid is proud and confident, then all will turn out well. And many years later, someone did another study just to see in which direction the cause was working, and they found that it was in the opposite direction. So the good grades were causing the self-esteem, and self-esteem wasn't causing good grades, and it, wasn't the, it was even worse. So kids who are raised just to have high self-confidence and not excel at anything, it can be sports or music, doesn't have to be school, but kids who are just proud of themselves and then fail at everything, in the end they will have a very low self-esteem and not be able to make anything of their life. So this was a very serious correlation mistake. And what I want for today is for you to remember that the next time someone wants to prove that there is a causal relation between something and something else, it can be anything, it can be vaccines and autism, it can be female bankers and the financial crisis. And if they point out to you that there is a very strong relation, remember that it's not enough to have a correlation. It gives a very good hint of what might be happening, but before you can conclude that one thing causes something else, you need to know why it does and how it does. So when in doubt, just remember the ice cream. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you for watching this video. I hope it made the point clear. We go back to our presentation just to demonstrate some more myth um, on those topics. So once we do understand the, the difference between causality and and association, there are actually a small case series of vitamin D and COVID-19 that uh, in investigators studied about four patients with vitamin D deficiency that were diagnosed with COVID-19 in April 2020. Patients were treated with either low dose of vitamin D, which is a thousand international unit, or high dose, which is 15,000 a day for five days. Patients who received high dose of vitamin D achieved normalization of vitamin D levels 
shorter hospitality, uh, uh, hospital stay, lower supplemental oxygen requirements, and reduced blood markers of inflammation. So coming soon, there are a way more vitamin D studies. There is a study from Queen Mary University on London, which has been launched. Um, they have enrolled 5,000 people to see if high-dose vitamin D can reduce winter, re winter respiratory infections, including COVID-19. And there are at least another 31 other studies that are listed and registered in vi uh, involving vitamin D and COVID-19. So to conclude this, can vitamin D help prevent COVID? If you are deficient in vitamin D, uh, then of course it is important for your health and you should be taking it. Uh, it would help you uh, as, as stimulate the immune function. It will support your bone health and other body system. If you're not deficient in vitamin D and when you take access vitamin D over time, you can develop toxicity. It can cause you excess blood calcium, hypercalcemia, bone pain, kidney problems, such as the formation of calcium stones and nasus and vomiting. A few dietary sources for vitamin D, uh, when we keep in mind that for adults, the recommended da uh, daily amount of vitamin D is 600 international units a day, would be fish from northern seas, such as mackerel, trout, and salmon. Please note that when eating those, you get both vitamin D and omega-3 fatty acids, which are also essential for your immune system. You can get vitamin D from mushroom. Pay attention, only 100 grams of mushrooms supply you with a half of the daily value. Egg yolks, uh, fortified cereals, and fortified, fortified milk all contain vitamin D. So. We are now going to think, and there is, looking backwards into the vitamin D uh, list, there is actually um, no reason why people would be deficient in vitamin D, especially in Israel, uh, when there is so much sun and people are exposed to it. Okay, so now we'll, we're going to talk about um, whether zinc might prevent um, uh, corona. And uh, we might remember that this was made wildly popular by President Trump, who appeared to be taking for a period of time uh, supplemental zinc together with a certain antibiotic and the anti-malarial uh, hydroxyquinoline, uh, HCQ, HQC, Um I do want to make a point about that nice video. Yeah, honestly, oh, we'll make room. And I'm like, uh, we have room. True. I mean, that would, I mean, the truth is, it could do. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> as, um, okay, I do want to make a comment about the nice video that Vered shared with us. Um, in my statistics class, I make my students repeat three times, correlation is not causation. And I told them that if I wake them up in the middle of the night, I expect them to be able to recite that to me. It's that important a concept in science. So let's go back to zinc now. Uh, what is zinc? Zinc's an essential trace mineral. That means we have to consume it in our diets in order to obtain it. There's no specialized tissue that stores zinc. so. Uh, we're going to need to consume it in order for it to be somewhere in our bodies. Um, why is zinc important? It participates in the activity of some 100 enzymes. So you can see that it's metabolically very active. Some of that activity involves protein synthesis. It supports the normal growth and development of humans from the fetal age onward. It's very important in wound healing and importantly, Pay attention, it's important for maintaining the sense of taste and smell and immune function. So we can see here that this is where scientists started to think, oh, taste and smell. Well, that's one of the cardinal symptoms of COVID is the loss of taste and smell. So perhaps this has something to do with zinc. Okay. So zinc deficiency is characterized by growth retardation, loss of appetite, and impaired immune function, which again is another thing that rang bells that perhaps this might have something to do with COVID. And 
it's important for the development and activation of immune cells. And uh, it's also hypothesized that it may prevent the um, replication of the virus in the nasopharynx, which is where we appear to be introduced to COVID. We breathe it in, right? And so inadequate zinc status is associated with increased susceptibility to pneumonia and other infections, particularly in the elderly. So all of these things together really gave people a hypothesis that zinc must somehow be associated with the prevention and or treatment of COVID. So is there an association? Well, there's a physician in New York who claims to have significantly reduced hospitalization rates among newly diagnosed COVID patients. And he collected 141 such patients, and he treated these patients with a combination of zinc, low-dose HCQ, which is the malaria drug, and the antibiotic azithromycin. Um, he claims that the hospitalization rate was only 2.8% in his treated group versus 15.4% of an untreated control group, which was sort of, um, not people that he examined, it was kind of like a historic control group. Um, the, death rate, the death rate in his treated group was 0.71% versus 3.5% in the untreated group. Um, I do wanna point out that this analysis of this physician was not peer reviewed. Um, there's a web address here where if you're interested and you'd like to read more about it, you can. Um, the physician whose name is Zelenko is uh, a Hasidic a Jewish physician who lived in the Muncie area in New York, those of you who know the area, um, he's vanished. So that kind of makes us a little bit suspicious that maybe not everything that was being said is 100% um, accurate, but it's out there. Okay. Um, but there are more zinc studies better performed uh, in the literature and in the making. There are 32 clinical trials registered right now in uh, a number of different clinical trial registries. Uh, none of these is going to be testing zinc alone, but it is going to be testing them together with other uh, interventions. And those include, again, the hydroxychloroquine, the, the, the malaria drug, the antibiotic azithromycin, and in combination with other vitamins and minerals, one of them would be vitamin D. So can zinc help prevent COVID? Well, if you're deficient in zinc, and I wanna preface this by saying you're not deficient in zinc, um, then you may need to be taking a supplement. And if you take a supplement, it might help your immune system. People who are at increased risk of zinc deficiency are people with Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, and other terrible gastrointestinal disorders, people who've had bariatric surgery, vegetarians, and alcoholics. If you're not deficient in zinc, uh, and I promise you you're not, excess zinc can cause adverse events. It's not a harmless substance to take. And these include nausea, vomiting, appetite loss, low copper levels, um, because zinc and copper compete for the same uptake mechanism. It can cause impaired immunity, low levels of HDL cholesterol, that's the good cholesterol. So it's lowering our good cholesterol, which is not a good thing to have happen. It can increase risk for heart disease. Um, if you wanna take a zinc supplement, taking 40 milligrams a day is the upper limit of safety. And beyond that, you are running the risk of, of, of toxicity. Um, but there are dietary sources of zinc. And if you're eating meat, that's why I'm saying, I promise you, you're not uh, deficient for um, zinc. Let's take a look here. The average adult needs to take eight to 11 milligrams a day of, of zinc, needs to consume that. If you eat 100 grams of ribeye steak, and that's not a large portion of steak, you're already getting 14 milligrams a day of zinc. A chuck steak, the same amount, 11 milligrams. If you're eating hemp seeds, people who are into cannabis, um, that 100 grams is gonna give you 10 milligrams of zinc. I'm not sure how much that actually comes to in consuming it, but I guess people do it. A chicken leg, 100 grams is five milligrams of zinc and tofu, 100 grams will give you four milligrams of zinc. So you can see that we can easily obtain it from the diet and there's really not a reason to be taking a supplement. 
Um, so what can we conclude in the end about zinc and vitamin D and corona? Um, the idea, the rationale that vitamin D or zinc could benefit a corona patient or prevent corona is it's really quite logical. I mean, we know that there's roles for both of these nutrients in the immune system, but there's no convincing evidence at this moment to support that either nutrient is going to be of benefit. There are studies underway. And in general, we prefer to wait for the evidence than to risk taking excess levels of these nutrients if we're not deficient in them. Varig, you're on, uh, you're, you're on mute. We wanted to check in addition whether or not breakfast is the most important meal of the day. Now the Talmud is, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay, so Talmud advises us to eat breakfast like a king, lunch like a regular person, and dinner like a pauper. Uh, as we already um, start to be suspect, suspectful, association between eating breakfast and disease risk, and actually a lower risk, is known for atherosclerosis, for cardiovascular mortality, and for type 2 diabetes mellitus for those who eat breakfast. But there are no evidence that these associations are actually causal. Uh, the association between breakfast and disease possibility are mediated through weight fluctuation. Breakfast skipping and overweight obesity has been examined in several trials, the pre-assumption is that regular eating versus skipping meals, uh, in specifically breakfast, is protective against obesity. The concept is that if you skip your breakfast, it may lead you to overeat later in the day. From the literature, we know that there is no evidence that skipping breakfast causes obesity. Studies are largely observational and cannot assess causality. That means eating breakfast and the uh, risk factor or the disease has been checked at the same time. So actually we cannot draw a longitudinal kind of conclusion. Uh, we, we, have, we, has, uh, we, have, um, we have managed to find two published clinical trials that actually failed to identify, uh, to identify any association between breakfast skipping and overweight obesity. And, it sums up to a question of why we believe what we believe and without evidence. So we know that research has so many, so many uh, problems and issues that uh, can lead us to wrong conclusions. We, we started with the causality and the association difference, but while Mona was speaking and, and emphasizing the fact that today, to date, we have no, we don't have enough evidence that will um, demonstrate that either uh, vitamin D or zinc are actually uh, healing from uh, the flu or COVID or anything, and she emphasized it to date, I was thinking about the fact that every day new research is coming up and distinguishing between the level of evidence and, and the robustness of the research is really difficult even for us as researchers. So research is lacking Pro probative value. We know that many studies about questions that have already been sufficiently answered are being conducted, and that actually additional studies add no knowledge but create the appearance of, uh, of, of many or, or, or a richness of evidence which actually is not true. We also know that biased re research reporting exists as well, and it's the same manner that uh, people are confused. Some researchers confused the, the public in interpreting the study results inaccurately and improperly use the causal language, whereas they do not use the kind of information, data, or statistical models to support it. So that causes a lot of confusion for sure. And this may be one of the reasons why people believe things that are actually not true. So just to conclude the, the topic of breakfast, should you eat at breakfast? Of course, if you regularly consume breakfast, continue to do so. 
Now, it is not only whether or not you consume the breakfast, is it, the quality is what matters here. So we know that including fruits and, ve and vegetables, whole grains and low dairy products or equivalent proteins is important. On the other hand, if you regularly skip breakfast and you feel good doing, doing so, just continue to do so. In fact, we know uh, that weight loss is not contingent upon breakfast. And for those people who do not regularly eat breakfast and would add breakfast to their diet, it can actually lead to weight gain. So maybe not recommended. Um, myth five is that drinking juice is a good way to increase fruit and vegetable intake. Um, the short answer is no, it's not. It, we all know you're supposed to take, uh, to consume about five servings a day of fruits and vegetables. That translates to one and a half to two cups a day of fruit and two to three cups a day of vegetables. We do know that in the United States, only about 10% of the adults consume an adequate number of fruits and vegetables. In Israel, we do a little better than that. Um, but why do we need fruits and vegetables? Well, first of all, it's associated with a decreased risk of lots of chronic diseases, including heart disease, stroke, hypertension, type two diabetes, and certain cancers. So that's a pretty good reason in, in and of itself to consume an adequate number of fruits and vegetables. Also, uh, there's some evidence that if you replace high calorie foods with low calorie fruits and vegetables, you can, uh, benefit you can prevent obesity or treat obesity or maintain weight loss so that's also a good thing uh, fruits and vegetables are good sources of all the nutrients that we need and that includes things like potassium which has to do with blood pressure control for example vitamin c which we've discussed folic acid which is very important for women in the um, uh, reproductive years um, and phytochemicals, which we're only now beginning to understand the way they work in the human body. Um, among most OECD countries, the most frequently consumed vegetable is the potato, um, which I think most of us tend to think of less as a vegetable and more as a sort of like a bread substitute. Um, the potato in and of itself, it's not a harmful vegetable, but uh, it's probably better to be emphasizing other sorts of uh, vegetables. And the most frequently consumed fruit product is fruit juice, orange juice in particular. Um, so which fruits and vegetables should we be consuming? And the answer is all of them. Fresh fruits and vegetables are ideal. Obviously, if you can eat the fresh fruits and vegetables, that's what you should be doing but not to shy away from frozen or canned fruits and vegetables. Um, one of the barriers we find to people consuming an adequate number of fruits and vegetables a day is the time involved in preparing them. And I think we can all imagine ourselves standing in the kitchen when we're tired and starting to cut tomatoes and cucumbers and everybody goes, oh God, who can be bothered? This is why uh, we're starting to look at um, high quality frozen and canned fruits and vegetables as alternatives to fresh, especially in low income households where there might be um, a, a, a head of household who's working a lot and perhaps doesn't have time to be preparing meals. Well, this is a good way anyways to get fruit and vegetables into the diet, even if it's not fresh, it's better than nothing. Um, so if you want to increase your fruit and vegetable intake, there are a lot of strategies that can help you do it um, and the, these strategies may also work with a finicky child who, who's not interested in doing so. So the first thing is you want to take only small steps. You can add vegetables to things like pizza, casserole, sandwiches, soups, and omelet, things that are less uh, visually offensive to the finicky child or to the adult who's not used to consuming fruits and vegetables. Um, you can substitute uh, a fruit or vegetable for the usual side dish that you might order like french fries. So clearly a fresh fruit or vegetable would be a better choice. Um, you can build a meal around fruits and vegetables. This is for the more advanced person. Things like creating a vegetable curry or a vegetable casserole as the center of the meal. So that's a really good way to get the fruits and vegetables in. And then I think 
another way to do it is to have cut up fruits and vegetables ready that we can snack on instead of grabbing a cookie or chips or something like that. So that's another good way to get it into the diet. So why not juice? Well, one cup of 100% fruit juice has about 120 calories and 25 grams of sugar. And I hate to tell you this, but that's the same sugar and calories as a can of cola. So it doesn't provide any of the fiber that consuming fresh fruits and vegetables provides. That's another reason, I don't know how popular it is in Israel, but where I'm originally from, California, people routinely do the, these juice cleanses where all they do is eat juice, drink juice for 10 days at a time. Um, and you would think that that would be, a, or maybe you would think that would be a healthy thing. In fact, we find these people become horribly constipated because they have no fiber in this period of time where they're supposedly cleansing their bodies. Um, so drinking juice is also not as filling as consuming a whole fruit or vegetable. So that's another reason you get less satiety. So it's really not an ideal way to be increasing your fruit and vegetable intake. So our question to you now, and perhaps it's been in the chat is, do you guys have questions about any other nutrition topics that you would like to, um, that perhaps you'd like to ask us about? Um, thank you, Mona. I just wanted to, to um, start replying to a few questions that were raised here. Maxine was asking, is there an Israeli list of which brands are low in salt, sugar, and fat? So I'm happy to say, and maybe some of you have already came across it, that um, in Israel, we have launched new food labeling. So it actually enables everyone in the point of purchase to be able to, to identify which foods are high in fat, sugar, and salt. It has um, a, a red symbol. It is actually written. And the green symbols uh, um, emphasize foods that are low in fat, low in sugar, and low in, in sodium. So it's really helpful. And, and, and um, I've been sitting in this committee, and I'm actually very much surprised to see what a good uptake do, do the, the public do? And, and we get very good um, uh, comments on how useful is it. So that, that's the way we do it here now. Any more questions? Uh, let me have a look in the chat, in just chat. Um, we, ha uh, we haven't mentioned organic versus non-organic food. Uh, any advantage? Mona, would you like? <laughs> Mona loves this topic, so. Um, okay. Uh, organic means uh, generally that the food will have been grown without the addition of chemical fertilizer or chemical pesticides or herbicides in, in growing the vegetables. It, which sounds, I mean, obviously just the thought that it sounds logical. Well, of course, that's going to be more, uh, that's going to be healthier for you than a non-organic item. On, okay, so there's two things that I wanna say. First, we don't have good evidence, or in fact, any evidence, that the consumption of regular non-organic fruits and vegetables is associated with an increase in any kind of uh, morbidity, any kind of illness. Um, it appears that whatever amount we're getting in our fruits and vegetables, it's not adequate to cause disease. It, there is uh, an occupational exposure. For example, the, the, the um, people who spray the fields, um, their exposure is very different from somebody like us who all we're doing is eating the food. Um, those people can get an occupational exposure which will be quite hazardous and may result in an increase in certain types of cancers and uh, disruption of their reproductive abilities. But most of us aren't spraying fields. So the exposure is not the same. It doesn't appear to be associated with illness. Now, if we step away from our own personal health and we look at the societal benefit, if you're raising food in an organic fashion, the yield is quite low relative to the intensity of the labor put into it. And when you're looking at a population that's growing exponentially around the world, 
we're not going to be able to feed that population using organic methods only. So in terms of a food production method and our ability to create food security for most nations, uh, especially low income nations, but for all nations, I don't think that organic farming is going to provide the answer. If I may add to this another comment um, from the uh, Ministry of Agriculture, I have been told that in Israel, the cultivating fields are, are insufficient in space and, and, and distances needed uh, to grow real organic food. So that is another issue. And another topic to touch upon organic food is the fact that if you do not spray for instance, fruit and vegetables, they actually produce their own cytokines or their own anti-inflammatory or anti-bacterial um, anti, um, or fungal uh, um, materials, which may be even more toxic than whatever um, artificial spray that you would have sprayed them with. So it would actually may cause you even more damage if you eat more of them. Um, a few more questions that we have here. Is a smoothie a good way to get your fruit and veg? Yes, it is because it maintains your fibers. Um, one thing that I would like to say about a smoothie is that if you want to keep it healthy, don't add sugar or honey or, uh, or um, maple syrup to it. Otherwise it gets very, very uh, high in calories. And in addition, if you are diabetes, that is out of the question, usually speaking, because it, it elevates your blood sugar very rapidly. Um, any more questions? And, and please feel comfortable. Guys, you're to all welcome to unmute yourselves as well and to ask the question in person. There are some more questions there if you want to keep going. No, I'll be happy to hear people and see them if they wish to speak. Yeah. So just read the last one and then everybody can unmute themselves. And I also have two questions. All right. So Stanley says, my myth is about eggs, which I did not eat for many years after evident that I that it caused heart attack. Now I read it's okay to eat eggs. Yes, absolutely. Stanley, go ahead. It, it, <laughs> is, <laughs> it is not only, uh, it, it is, egg is, is a wonderful source of protein. And yeah. it is actually recommended uh, for the entire population to eat six and even even more in some cases, six eggs a week. So one egg a day, um, that's it. Good. So please enjoy so, it. So my question is about the new trend of veganism and what kind of nutrition does it bring to us? Is that enough? And uh, one thing at a time. <laughs> Well, sure. Um, okay, you can absolutely create a vegan diet that's balanced and nutritious and adequate. In order to do that, you should probably not try to do it on your own without advice from somebody who has good experience um, creating such a diet. And I'd like to say that uh, not every dietitian knows how to create such a diet. There are uh, dietitians who specialize in vegan nutrition, and I would suggest that someone who'd like to make that lifestyle change consult with such an expert to make sure that they don't end up deficient. Um, the American Dietetic Association has very recently announced that a vegan diet absolutely can provide everything that you need. Is it superior to a non-vegan diet? I think the, ju the jury is still out in terms of an evidence-based response to that, but it's at least as good. The only Candy. thing that vegans have to, to be supplemented with is vitamin B12. That can only be found in- um, In meat, in that's meat. correct. Okay. 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 Thank you guys, it's been so informative and enjoyable. Please unmute yourselves and ask questions. In the meantime, I will ask uh, one more question about raw food. Is there, is there benefit to eating only raw food? Mm, actually, no, uh, if, if I need to. to um. Yeah, yeah so, that's good to answer. So, so I will divide it. Fresh fruit and vegetables that contain vitamin C are better fresh. However, 
food such as carrots, it contains beta carotene that needs to be converted in our body to vitamin E, would actually enjoy some heat and, and, and the addition even of oil to be, to be better absorbed and, and function. So it is, mm. it really has to do with, with which food are you speaking about. And in addition, um, looking into digestion. So we know that cooking, um, especially if we look into, for instance, uh, peas or lentils or any of those group, um, you can't eat them raw. I mean, or if you eat some raw, it will really cause you hard digestion and abdominal pain, uh, even, et cetera, et cetera. It, it is better. You're better off if you cook them. Um, that's it. Yeah. Briefly. <laughs> Unless Mona would like to add on to this one. No, I think you covered it well. Thank you, ladies. So does anybody else have a question? If if I can, uh, uh, Adrian, sure, you go ahead. Not a question. I just wanted to. Um, if no one's going to ask any questions, um, I'd like to just thank Telford for hosting us again tonight. It's been a pleasure being uh, with everybody. I thank everybody who joined. Um, we look forward to seeing you next week um, when Professor Ashkenazi gives the uh, the, the final uh, lecture in our series. Uh, I don't know if uh, if. Uh, you, you want to mention about a bit before the end, but we look forward to meeting, to seeing you for that. And uh, we've been uh, honored to be associated with Telfed in this series of lectures. I can say as a South African also that I've tried a vegan diet, all I ate was chicken for a while. That was fine. <laughs> and uh, I wish everyone a good night from our real university. We, we look forward to seeing you next week. Um, and, and thank you all very much. It's been really exciting. And thank you, Mern and Verit, for, for a wonderful talk. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I also wanted to thank everybody. Thanks, Adrian. Thank you to Ariel University. And of course, to Mona and Vera too. It was just amazing. I mean, you can see how a wealth of knowledge that you both have. So thank you so much. I definitely learned some things that I, that I didn't know before. And uh, really, thank you so much for this partnership. And I just wanted to take a, take a minute to say that if anyone uh, you know, can make a donation. Telfed assists over 400 needy families per month. So if you're looking for a, a cause, please have Telfed in mind. And uh, I'll also post the link in the, in the chat. chat. I think, uh, there we go. Uh, I don't know what happened. Uh, Vivi, you're on mute, unfortunately, and speaking to us. In the meantime, unmute yourself. Hi, can everyone hear me? Now we can. Before okay, we sorry unmute. about that. I just wanted to thank everyone. Thank you to Ariel University. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you, of course, Mona and Varied for your wealth of knowledge. It was really incredible. I know I learned so much. And uh, we, we just really appreciate this partnership. Um, I posted in the chat a link to the Telford website. Telford does assist over 400 needy families per month. So if you're looking uh, somewhere, a, a charitable cause to donate to, please keep Telford in mind. And thanks once again. We look forward to seeing you all at uh, future online events. And you can check them all out on our website. And, uh, and please be in touch. We're, we're happy to see you. And uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you very week, much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Aviva. We look forward to the uh, upcoming events. As Adrian said, we've got uh, Ariel University again, Professor Ashkenazi, and I hope you'll all join us next Tuesday at 8. We also have, uh, when going back is not an option, with uh, Penina Taylor, a motivational speaker, and one that we've just added this week, an event with Rudy Rothman, He's an Israel rights activist, and I would be happy if you'd all join. It's an extremely interesting subject. Thank you again to Mona and to Verid and to the Ariel University, and a good night to you all until the next time. Thank good you. Night. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Good night. Good night.